webinar has started. Is it all right to make the interpretation announcement? Yes. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. My name is Emiliano, and I'm one of several language interpreters today. Uh, today's se uh, session will be presented in English and in French. And so we are asking everyone to participate in helping to make this a fully bilingual virtual webinar. Uh, in one moment, not yet, but in one moment, all participants will need to click on the globe on the bottom of their Zoom screen and select their language of preference and then click finish. If you are connected by phone or tablet today, you will need to click on the three dots for more options and from there find the language interpretation option. This means that during the meeting, everyone can simply speak in their language of preference and everyone else will be able to hear you. When you hear someone speaking in a language you don't understand, you will also hear the interpreters speaking in your language of preference. We are also offering Spanish interpretation today for Spanish speakers. So I'm going to repeat this message in Spanish, and then it will be repeated in French, and then we will turn on the interpretation function so you don't see the globe quite yet. Esta reunión se ofrece de manera bilingüe, va a haber presentadores eh, hablando en inglés y también francés hoy. En un momento, los participantes tendrán que dar clic en el globo situado en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Tendrán que seleccionar el idioma que dominan mejor, la idioma que dominan mejor y seleccionar finalizar. Si están conectados por teléfono o tableta, primero seleccionarán los tres puntos de más opciones para poder seleccionar interpretación. Durante la reunión, las personas de habla inglesa deben hablar en inglés, por ejemplo, y los intérpretes se expresarán en tiempo real en español. Los hispanohablantes deben hablar en español y los intérpretes lo harán en tiempo real en inglés. And I hand it over to the French interpreters. Bonjour, cette réunion va se dérouler en anglais et en français. Vous avez la possibilité d'avoir de l'interprétation qui vous sera euh, proposée. Vous le verrez dès que euh, l'interprétation sera euh, branchée, ce qui n'est pas encore le cas. Vous verrez un petit globe au bas de votre écran à droite. Il vous suffira de cliquer sur euh, la langue souhaitée. Si vous êtes bilingue, vous ne devez cliquer sur aucun, euh, vous ne devez pas vous occuper de ce globe et vous entendrez parler français lorsqu'on s'exprime en français, anglais quand on s'exprime en anglais. Voilà. Thank you. And Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Karen Scott, president of the Foundation for Opioid Response Efforts. And I am so honored and excited to welcome you all this afternoon to the second session of our event today on global crisis and change, overdose and health justice during and after COVID-19. This webinar is part of an event highlighting SUD researchers from around the world their work presents promising practices and policies and lessons learned. Lessons learned that can help us do a better job in treating opioid use disorder, preventing harm, and promoting social justice. This work has been shaped by the COVID-19 pandemic and it's work from which we can all learn. But first, go to the next slide. Um, for those of us who do not know 
know uh, the foundation, uh, just a word about FOUR. FOUR, or the Foundation for Opioid Response Efforts, is a private national grant-making foundation launched in 2018 in the United States to focus on the public health emergency of the opioid crisis. Our focus is on inspiring and accelerating actions to end the opioid crisis across the country. And we do that work by convening and supporting partners, advancing patient-centered evidence-based solutions to address the crisis. We focus on interventions that are patient-centered, and we think about developing our work across what we call our four Ps of needing to support professional education, payer and provider strategies, policy initiatives, and public awareness. We understand that we need to be investing in a comprehensive approach in order to have a significant long-term impact. So since our founding in 2018, I am very proud to say that to date we have awarded 64 grants, um, committing $28.8 million um, to organizations across the country. Our main programmatic areas to date have, are four. We focus on access to treatment for vulnerable populations. Our second program focused on responding to the COVID-19 pandemic through recovery services, as well as evaluating policy changes during COVID. Our third program is our innovation challenge, which, is, which was designed to tackle some of what we saw as the most intractable ongoing challenges to making meaningful long-term change. And those include stigma, addressing stigma, as well as generating more timely and actionable data. And finally, our most recent program uh, is a program on prevention, and it's a focus on family and community-based prevention uh, to uh, targeting some of the most um, vulnerable families in the country. The webinar today is focusing, is, uh, is focusing on work that came out of one of our COVID-19 response grants. The pandemic, of course, brought new challenges and also magnified already persistent issues related to the opioid crisis. We heard early on from our grantees about significant concerns with the ability to keep people connected as we locked down during the early months of, of the pandemic, keeping people in treatment and keeping people connected to their recovery supports. And so we responded with a series of grants supporting recovery organizations and helping those organizations transition to provide services safely during the pandemic including um, uh, the ability to have the technology and to provide virtual services. But we also recognize that there was an important opportunity to learn from many of the tempor temporary changes and innovations that were occurring during the pandemic as we tried to maintain access to treatment and recovery services. Those included temporary policy changes such as expending take-home doses for a methadone, as well as provider practice changes, such as the use of telehealth. So we funded several projects that aim to assess the impact of these regulatory relaxations, as well as provider innovations. We can learn from these, um, hopefully, in ways that will inform longer term improvements in access to treatment and related services. One of those projects was our grant to Dr. Helena Hansen and the Substance Use and COVID-19 Data Collaborative based at UCLA's, UCLA. This international collaborative of social scientists, community researchers, and public health clinicians have been pooling data and collecting field reports on grassroots innovations and social policies from around the world during the pandemic. The collaborative's work to date now culminates with the release just yesterday afternoon in a special supplement to the American Journal of Public Health focused on 12 hate manuscripts and opinion pieces, um, drawing lessons and data from this work around the world. You will hear about this work this afternoon 
as members of the collaborative showcase best practices and policies, as well as lessons learned for how we can improve access to treatment and harm reduction services going forward. This is FOR's first project and so far our only project that is supporting learning from international models and experiences. We are so pleased to have provided some support to Dr. Hansen and her amazing team around the world to get this work going, to get to the learnings that we're going to hear about today and that are in the journal supplement. And we fully appreciate the value of cross-cultural, cross-national learning and hope this is the beginning of a very thought-provoking, um, informative afternoon for, for everyone participating. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott, for your generosity, both in supporting this, um, this effort and uh, in opening up ceremonies for us today. I want to clarify that although I uh, channeled the grant funding from Four Foundation and from our other supporters, primarily through UCLA, it also has come through other institutions, it's been a, a really large group effort, and I'm honored to be working with such fantastic collaborators. We call ourselves the Substance Use and COVID Data Collaborative. And we were formed in May, in May of 2020, just after the emergence of COVID as a network of social scientists, community researchers and organizers and clinicians with field data on the impact of COVID-19, what it was doing uh, with regard to drug policy, people who use drugs, treatment, harm reduction organizations, the impact on all, those, um, all of those groups and services. And then, 59 members actually came together in short order and on short notice from 14 different countries in North and South America, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. We formed three working groups, one to generate new research on these issues, another to link research to policy and advocacy, and another to link to media outlets and to create media that bridges research findings um, with policy implications. Uh, we've received financial support from Four Foundation, also Open Society Foundation, the National Institute of Health in the US, UCLA and Yale Schools of Medicine, um, French, and I cannot pronounce the names of these two organizations, but I leave it to Marie, our partner, Marie Jeffret Rustid, to do so. Um, so EHESS and MILDECA, as well as the Canadian Institutes of Health. And we got technical assistance from the US National Academy of Medicine, the International Society for Addiction Medicine and the Drug Policy Alliance in the US. And as you'll hear in a moment, members of our collaborative uh, have published in this special supplement that, was, that just came out, um, actually yesterday it was published, where we'll put the link in the chat to the table of contents, which enables you to go to all of the individual papers. So thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, my name is Selena and I am actually the coordinator of the Substance Use Data Collaborative that Dr. Hansen just described. And I'm going to be introducing the special supplement in the American Journal of Public Health that this webinar is based on. Helena just mentioned it. Um, and so it is live today and I'm actually gonna just drop the link to the open access special issue right now. And it is a collection of 20 articles that many of, many of the researchers in our data collaborative have been working on. And the special issue is meant to highlight health justice and overdose in particular during COVID, as well as emphasize ethnographic methods and spotlight uh, peer-based organizations that are emphasizing harm reduction and grassroots work. If you joined us for our morning session, you probably heard from Urban Survivors Union and other groups who were also highlighted in this special issue. Um, it was a really intersectional focused um, special issue and you're gonna be hearing in a moment, the panels this afternoon about social justice and race and socioeconomic status issues in um, overdose and treatment. So I have the link in the chat. I just dropped it. 
Um, and this was just published yesterday, so you can access all of the papers that are included in this special issue um, in that link. And we're hoping you can share this with your, your networks and your colleagues, um, and it'll be a great, it's, it's meant to coincide with this webinar as well. So thank you so much for joining us, and I'm looking forward to the afternoon session. Hello, everyone. Good evening uh, from um, the UK, <laughs> where it is the evening. Um, you're very welcome uh, to this panel, uh, the third panel overall in the second session of this uh, incredibly uh, relevant and interesting uh, webinar. Um, so our panel now will be around addressing social and racial inequalities in harm reduction and treatment. Um, my name is Joe Tay, uh, I'll be chairing this today. And our first speaker, our first presenter will be Hansel Tooks from the University of Miami. And um, I believe we'll be talking on indigenous leadership in harm reduction. Um, so I'll uh, invite Hansel to take over. All right, thank you. I, I'm going to be speaking about the harm reduction leaders paper. I'm just trying to share my screen here and get started. All right, so I have the great pleasure uh, and pressure of opening up the panel on addressing social and racial inequalities in harm reduction and treatment. I am Hansel Tooks, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, and I am a proud harm reductionist. So I want to take a moment to celebrate our recently retired Executive Director of the National Harm Reduction Coalition. When I texted Monique last night for permission to pull this from her Facebook page, she was deservedly in a ceramics class, but I know that all of us here are thankful for the leadership of Monique Tula. My first National Harm Reduction Conference was in 2016 in San Diego, and I remember watching her give a plenary, hearing about the North Star Statement, knowing that I had found my home as a researcher and as an activist. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the North Star Statement is the following. It says the National Harm Reduction Coalition creates spaces for dialogue and action that help heal the harms caused by racialized drug policies. Seeing leadership that looked like me was a critical dose of inspiration and when I knew I belonged in this movement. And so I just wanna say, Monique, congratulations on your retirement. So I'm here to present the Harm Reduction Leaders paper. And I believe I was chosen because Ayana Jordan is on an, air, an airplane to ASAM. But I'm happy to share with you my experiences as a clinician who has successfully stepped into making meaningful drug policy change, in Florida no less. And I would like to dedicate this talk to my muse, Jose de Lemos, may he rest in peace, who served as my inspiration in the Florida Capitol. Jose's boisterous voice and smile greeted everybody who entered the idea exchange in our early days, and he is greatly missed. And we do this work to honor him. So here is bringing evidence-based prevention to Florida. This is an academic medicine paper that highlights a, the last decade of my life. and. I had the, the privilege of, of co-authoring this paper with my dean. And I have to say the impact of having a black dean has been immeasurable, mostly because I, when I witnessed his first graduation conferring the MDs, I was able to see the possibilities of my own future. But back to the advocacy, I spearheaded the 10 year journey to bring syringe services programs to Florida. And this is no simple task because the political climate is complex. So how did this happen? And how did a black gay guy from Miami convince the Florida legislature to legalize syringe services program? Well, this was prior to the don't say gay bill and the woke bill. And the story begins at the National Harm Reduction Conference in 2008 in Miami. So Lisa Metch, who's the most important force in my career was attending a talk by Alex Crowell about syringe litter in San Francisco. We were able to replicate the methods of their study in Miami, and we showed that we had eight times the number of syringes uh, on our streets in the absence of syringe services programs. And that was the first key translational study that showed a significant need uh, for these programs, primarily in Miami-Dade County. So we, meaning a bunch of medical students and I, went to Tallahassee to advocate for life-saving syringe services 
programs. This is the humanitarian thing to do. But we found that the fiscal arguments were much more effective than the humanitarian. So we conducted a study that showed that the cost of preventable infections like endocarditis, abscesses, cellulitis at our safety net hospital, Jackson Memorial, was $11.4 million in one year. And so Rick Scott signed Senate Bill 242, which authorized our pilot program in Miami. But since it was only a five-year pilot project, it was imperative for us to do rapid evidence-based implementation and evaluation, including statewide analyses, so that we could successfully advocate for expansion of our program. Um, the reduction in the number of opioid overdose deaths that you see here was our first major success with the street level distribution of naloxone. And um, you can see that uh, to date we have five legal syringe services programs uh, in the state of Florida, we were able in 2019 to successfully advocate for the expansion of, our, of syringe services programs and Governor Ron DeSantis signed that law. Um, we definitely benefited from the reduction of the overdose deaths, but unfortunately nationwide, we all know that these trends have reversed in the COVID era, particularly in communities of color. So what can we do to save lives in communities of color? I, I do wanna take a moment to thank for, uh, thank you, Dr. Scott, for funding our low barrier buprenorphine program focused on engaging the black community. Arrow, who's pictured here, is my, my right hand. He's my co-professor, and I'm so thankful for his recovery and seeing him thrive on the staff of the Idea Exchange. With the $4 in response to the pandemic, we were able to implement the buprenorphine initiation and treatment experience, the only low barrier buprenorphine in the state. And this is in direct opposition to the punitive recovery culture in Florida. And we have seen a total of 161 people since its inception and 53% are retained at three months. So this has been going very well, but I'm here to discuss the harm reduction leadership paper. And it was amazing to work with these esteemed co-authors. Uh, Marcus and Selena, thank you both for your leadership on this paper. Sarah from Uganda, Ayana at NYU, Morgan at the state of Colorado, Joseph with Exponents in New York, and finally Patricia with UCSD. Thank you for honoring me uh, to present this, this work today. So the models of care for substance use disorder and harm reduction that Black and Latinx leaders have developed based on our own social position and experiences are uniquely focused on social connections, community inclusion, and ultimately advocacy for a more just social order. US health agencies should proactively support a social justice approach to substance use disorder and harm reduction, harm reduction interventions to turn back the tide of the record uh, overdose rates through community focused and institutionally supported efforts and policies. And to that end, we recommend the following. So we must invest in educational pipeline gaps to support BIPOC trainees in harm reduction. This is in medicine, in law, in social work. I believe the Miller School where I teach and lead the longitudinal substance use disorder curriculum is one of the only ones in the country that treaches about substance use exclusively through a harm reduction lens. And thank you to Dean Ford for, for giving me that, that, that task. We need lawyers as harm reduction advocates. We need social workers as harm reductionists. We need BIPOC students and trainees pursuing innovative work to support the health and well-being of Black and, Black and Latinx people who use substances. Medical and research institutions must provide funding, must provide protected time, and must provide mentors. Dr. Jordan and her innovative work in churches in New Haven uh, comes to mind. But medical institutions must step up for junior faculty. I had 50% of my time protected when I came on faculty. Strong mentorship like I have with Lisa Metch and my dean are essential. And of course, we wish Dr. Jordan well in her new endowed professorship at NYU. So we have to promote harm reduction and treatment approaches informed by social justice, structural competency, thank you, Dr. Hansen, and social determinants of health. So everything that we as researchers and leaders do that is effective or innovative has been done by the community and folks we serve for years. As we become members of the movement, we cannot forget the roots in social justice, social structural competency, and with it, the generational harm that the racist drug war has caused. And we must pay special attention to the social determinants of health, prioritizing the needs of people who use drugs versus what we believe 
would best help them. Uh, people who inject drugs and use drugs are experts in their own health. So with all grants, all classes, people who inject drugs must be uh, in the room where it happened. We also need mainstream clinical education and practice with curriculum development uh, led by BIPOC faculty, community members, and people with lived experience. I cannot understate the impact of harm reduction education. Uh, we are currently publishing our curriculum here at the Miller School. And this is essential because the traditional healthcare system has failed people who use drugs. This is how we make change. We need to set the traditional healthcare system aside and meet people where they are, all while training the next generation to treat people who use drugs with kindness and love. So this is the dream slide. So we, we have to support the development of Black and Latinx leadership in the field, uh, and medical and research institutions should build a national network of Black and Latinx harm reduction leaders through funding training grants, fellowships, and early career stage mentorship programs. I mean, can you imagine a network of BIPOC leaders in, national, in harm reduction in this country? And I wanna say today, if anyone here needs mentorship, please reach out to me, it would be an honor. Finally, the last slide, community, community, community. As was said in, said in the sessions earlier today, we must center harm reduction initiatives with community leaders. Health systems and research institutions should adopt a community engaged approach as the gold standard. We have to center all harm reduction initiatives on community leaders, peers, and community-based participatory research. Recently, as syringe services programs became legal in Florida, I asked the Florida Harm Reduction Collective, which is our statewide organization led by people who use drugs, drugs, if it was time for me to take a step back and follow their leadership. What they said to me, I will always remember. They said, no, we don't want you in the back seat. We just want you to bring us to the front seat with you. And behalf, on behalf of my co-authors and everybody else here today, we shall. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Hansel. Um, that is an excellent paper and an excellent presentation. I learned a lot uh, from reading it and uh, I'd encourage everyone here today to, to have a look at the AGPH um, special issue. We are going on now to um, Esben Huberg from Aarhus University in Denmark and uh, he will be talking about the drug consumption rooms uh, paper, Welfare State and Diversity in Social Acceptance in Denmark and France. You're very welcome, um, Esben. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, unique event. Um, I'm an associate professor at the Center for Alcohol and, and Drug Research uh, at the University of Aarhus uh, in Denmark. Uh, and I'm just trying to share my slides here. Hopefully you can see them. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, on the basis of a paper that I, uh, I've written with uh, Marie Chouffret uh, Roustit from, uh, from France about drug consumption rooms in, in uh, Paris and Copenhagen. Uh, and I will start with a short presentation of Danish drug policy and then move on to present the historical background for Danish harm reduction policy, after which I will talk about uh, drug consumption rooms in, in Denmark. Um, in 1955, possession of illegal drugs became a criminal offense in Denmark, but drug use in itself was not a made a crime. From 1969 to 2004, possession of illegal drugs for personal use uh, was de facto decriminalized uh, in Denmark. The police and prosecution were ordered uh, uh, in most cases to refrain from charging uh, people with possession for personal use. And if they made charges, they should, uh, they should settle the cases with a warning. The basic idea was that prevention, treatment, education, and social reform sh should reduce drug demand, while uh, crim criminal sanctions should reduce uh, drug supply. Use of drugs and uh, drug-related problems were seen as uh, what could call, be called a normal social problem that should be reduced by the means of the welfare state. In 2004, as part of a general tough on crime policy, an, an internet, an, uh, a zero tolerance policy was introduced. But there was one important exception with regards to harm reduction, because uh, marginalized people who are dependent on drugs uh, should not be sanctioned, but, left, but, but be left off uh, with a warning. 
However, my research has shown that in many cases, this has not been the case. Um, but me. parallel to, sorry. Very good job to you, Esben. Um, your slides are not moving forward, uh, I'm afraid. I don't think you're in presentation mode. Uh, what are you seeing? Adjust your uh, PowerPoint, you know, software, but not not the ah, presentation okay. as such yet. Thank you. Sorry about that. Sorry to I'll, I'll try to. Uh... And um, sorry, it's been just a, a, another very small uh, thing to say from the interpreter. I have just asked if you could speak a little slower. So we can interpret <laughs> for you. Uh, yeah. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are you seeing the slides now? Yes, but not in a presentation mode. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, how do I do this? Because I can, I can see it in presentation mode on my screen. Do you have multiple screens? Yes. Uh, when you're sharing, make sure that you're sharing the second screen that this is being presented from, the one that you have up right now. Do you see it now? Just a, a zoomed in version of your uh, slideshow beginning. Try it again. Um, I'll stop sharing and then try to share once, once more. And see if it prompts you for the second screen and the PowerPoint that's playing on there. Now I'm, I'm sharing the second screen. That is perfect. There you go. Oh, perfect. Great. Thank you. And I'll try to slow down. Um, so parallel to the introduction of, of the zero tolerance, there's been a a focus on social rights and harm reduction in, in Danish drug policy also. Um, there have been uh, established formal social rights for drug treatment. Uh, uh, substitution treatment with heroin has been introduced and uh, drug consumption rooms have been introduced as part of uh, Danish drug policy. The idea of harm reduction was introduced in Denmark in the mid 1980s as a response to social inclusion, exclusion of marginalized drug users from drug treatment and other social and health services. Um, where abstinence, ha abstinence had become the condition for receiving help. Uh, the, res the response was um, the introduction what, on, what, on what was called graduated goals where all services that could reduce harm and increase resources should be provided to drug users, even if uh, illegal uh, use of drug con drugs continued. This could range from the most basic levels such as food and shelter to various forms of drug treatment, including substitution treatments. So it was not just a matter of public health, but a matter of social inclusion of drug users in the services of the welfare state that started harm reduction. Uh, in Denmark. Later, a few years later, when HIV and AIDS arrived, uh, a much more explicit focus on, on public health uh, was introduced. Um, so, in Edwin, we seem to have lost you for a minute there. Are you... Yeah, um, it says that my internet connection is unstable. Uh... We can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes. I, I'll just check my cable just a minute. <laughs>
seem to have temporarily um, lost Esben again. I, I wonder if we should go on to our discussions perhaps and come back to Esben. Oh, hang on. Yeah, um, Esben. Um, can, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, is uh, everything going okay on your end now? I lost my I, I lost my internet connection for for a moment. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, not at all. Um, yeah, are you able to share your screen? Yeah, I'll um, I'll do that. Uh, sorry about this. Oh. So, are you seeing the screen now? Yes. Good. But not the presentation um, yet. Sorry? Uh, but not the presentation yet. I don't think you have got that up as yet. Uh, I should be sharing this, the second screen. I think you may have minimized uh, PowerPoint. Click on the icon on the bottom. Yeah, I'm not sure which one you mean. <laughs> the one you have uh, highlighted. Maybe. Yeah, the, the, the PowerPoint along your bottom toolbar. You see where it shows that you have Zoom open and then you also have PowerPoint open, the very, very bottom. Are you seeing this? Otherwise, I'll just just continue without the uh, <laughs> the slides. If that's I think okay. we might need we might need to do that, as Ben. If that's yeah, okay, yeah, please, please yeah. go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll try to speak slowly. I'm sorry about the mess. Um, so in 2012. Um, there was an amendment of the Danish uh, drug, drug legislation that made it possible for municipalities in Denmark uh, to establish uh, drug consumption rooms. Um, there was no prior scientific trial because the Danish authorities and the government thought that there was not, not international evidence uh, to just implement uh, the, the, the service right away. Um, but the drug consumption rooms were not just introduced as a public health measure to reduce drug related harm, but was also seen as a more broad social inclusion policy in reaction to general poor living conditions for marginalized drug users. In the comments to the law, it said that the government, government wants to put an end to marginalization, exclusion and unworthy living conditions and it's, it, is, it is an ambition to reduce the high mortality rate among uh, drug addicts, as it said. So again, it was a more general uh, ambition that, that uh, was part of Danish drug harm reduction policy. Today, four cities in Denmark have uh, drug consumption rooms. The three largest city in the country and a small municipality with 65,000 inhabitants. Municipalities decide if they want drug consumption rooms and get authorized to do so uh, by, the, by the Ministry of Health. The municipality can then delegate the task of running a drug consumption room to a private organization. When a municipality decides to establish a drug consumption room, it shall make an agreement with the local police about designating an area in the immediate vicinity of the drug consumption room where the police should not confiscate drugs for users of the drug consumption rooms. Um, I have done most of my research on the open drug scene and the drug consumption room in Copenhagen, um, where two drug consumption rooms run a 24 hour service um, uh, and, and, um, and where uh, 
I'll call it short. <laughs> um, uh, and we have, have we, we have uh, asked uh, residents about how they experience the drug scene and the drug consumption rooms. Um, and uh, and a vast majority of the residents uh, are actually in favor of the drug consumption rooms, while a small minority is against them. Um, so, in in what can be learned from from Danish uh, harm reduction policy? Well, perhaps uh, the most important lesson is that that it's it's a part of a social inclusion um, policy, and also that even though we uh, we have a zero tolerance policy, it's possible to have also a very you could say advanced harm reduction policy at the same time. So there's no, even though it may seem contra contradictory. It's actually it, it has been part of Danish drug policy for many years to to have a goal of socially including marginalized people, even though we at the same time have this zero tolerance policy. Thank you. And sorry you, about Edwin. the mess. <laughs> and, uh, well done for finishing exactly on time as well. And thank you so much for, for, for talking with us. And um, we are now at the point of the discussions uh, we have uh, with us. Um, Jade Boyd from the University of British Columbia and uh, followed by um, Dinah Ortiz. Hi, um, I'm coming in from Canada right now and I have had the opportunity to read both of the excellent papers that the presenters are uh, talking about today. And I just wanna say that it's quite an honor um, to be able to get the chance to listen to both the speakers and to engage with them on such important critical topics. And also particularly, I particularly appreciate that they also offer concrete recommendations on how to better address social and racial inequalities in harm reduction and treatment, which we don't always get to see, as well as the importance of civic and collective collaborations as the second speaker um, touches on. All of these things have implications in Canada for Canadian drug policy and practice as well. There's similarities regarding systemic exclusion and the need to counter punitive, medicalized and criminalized hi hierarchical approaches to substance use in our welfare state, as well as the need for approaches that redress or overhaul systems of oppression that perme permeate our criminal, social, and health systems. And um, I found it interesting that the th these themes ran through both talks around social justice, not just uh, medicalized or criminalized approaches to harm reduction, but the importance of social approaches, it, it, particularly in relation to civic collaboration, um, the inclusion of community, and most importantly, those with lived experience of substance use. And I just wanted to um, add a comment at the end of this um, that, you know, the first speaker really brings up the need for support, institutional and financial supports, if we want to address structural inequalities of systemic racism and criminalization and poverty, and uh, not just um, in terms of Black and Latinx leaderships or BIPOC leadership in terms of institutional support with funding, protected um, time for research and mentors, but also uh, support for those most impacted um, communities dealing with the confluence of systemic racism, criminalization and poverty, and that can increase barriers to participation, those who might uh, be at risk advocating for uh, harm reduction and substance use because it is criminalized um, and who may be uh, over surveilled those who risk burnout um, in terms of already um, being overtaxed, in terms of having to represent for their marginalized communities and um, having things downloaded to those communities without 
adequate social and financial supports, and also those who are struggling with over, you know, the impact of increased overdose deaths um, and struggling with profound grief and loss. So I guess um, as a discussion, just kind of leaving it open to how do we best support leadership and inclusion towards social justice approaches to harm reduction while also addressing these intersecting systems of oppression. And I'll pass it over to Dinah there. Thank you. Thank you, Jade. I, I should say as well, Dinah is from the Urban Survivors Union. You're very welcome. I'm sorry, you're on mute, Dinah. Sorry, that sorry always happens to me. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, Joseph and uh, Jade, thank you so much for introducing me. Um, I am from Urban Survivors Union um, and I am very honored to be here today. Um, what really stuck out for me in the paper when I read it, um, and because this is uh, my, my line of expertise, is uh, the uh, parent, pregnant and parenting women who use drugs, who are uh, most impacted by these harsh drug laws and um, by not being able to access uh, harm reduction services or syringe exchange services. Um, and a little bit about myself and my origin and how I got started. Um, I got started out in the uh, mass incarceration movement um, and I moved over to the drug users union movement um, when I started working at an organization called the Bronx Defenders where I was uh, a supervisor in family defense practice and I was representing parents who were impacted by the um, child welfare system. And um, these parents, uh, more and more, I noticed that they were not being charged with neglect or abuse because they were actually abusing their children, but because they were using drugs and due to drug use. And so uh, for me, um, that was my story. I had a child welfare case or a child regulation system case is what I like to call it, because there's nothing you know, about child welfare that's involved with that system. Um, and it just followed me throughout the years. And so even though I had also been impacted by the, the uh, mass incarceration, right? And being incarcerated, I was also um, like the most impactful thing for me and the most violating system was the one of the child regulation system where I was not receiving uh, support. Um, I was receiving surveillance and I was receiving punitive um, measures in order to force me to stop using, um, to be able to be reunited with my children. Um, and what we do realize is that, um, you know, marginalized parent, marginalized uh, women with an ex um, are not going to reach out and seek services that they need or seek the help that they want if they want it um, if they're being you know if they're being hit with um, with the uh, punitive measures that um, are in place currently and also you know um, as a leader um, in harm reduction, what I what I try to do is I try to, you know, what I try to do is I try to share about my story and I try to let people know that, um, you know, you don't, abstinence is not necessary, you know, despite what people think, you don't need to be abstinent. You can actually be a, a an active drug user and be a productive member, quote unquote, of society as people, you know, may want you to, you know, think that whatever that means, um, and pa parent your children productively, right? And, and they don't really understand that, how we, um, how we are, um, we are definitely, uh, you know, very powerful voices in the, um, in, in, in this movement, right? We are the ones that have been directly impacted um, and we are the ones that are more silenced, right? Um, the more uh, excluded from the movement, which, you know, when I say we, I mean us, you know, uh, black, brown and indigenous folks, uh, transgender, um, LGBTQ plus X, um, we are the ones that are the most um, uh, violated and the most silenced. And, and so, you know, lay on top of that, the fact that you are um, a woman and that you are a pregnant and parenting woman, um, or parenting women, you are not um, the, the 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 what do I say the the, the avenues 
for being able to voice what what is really needed um, are less and less available to us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Diana. That was very powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we are now going into our uh, period of questions. And I'm going to... Yeah, so actually, that's a good idea. Um, so Helena has uh, just um, made a really great suggestion, and that is if all four of our uh, participants in this panel could actually uh, come online. And perhaps if you've got questions for each other, uh, you know, this, this might be a good opportunity. Um, um, you know, in the next five minutes, um, if, 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 if that's of interest. And I might, if you don't mind, I might pose a question of my own for um, uh, Dina in particular. I'm really sorry if I've not pronounced your name correctly, Dina. Um, is it Dina or Dina? It is Dina. <laughs> and so I, I, it's, it's, a, it's something that has always concerned me, the, 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 que the queries that you raise. And it's one of the most difficult situations, I think, for both parties, although obviously far more for, for the woman who is being separated from, from her kids. And I was just really interested to know, surveillance, obviously nobody wants that, but at the same time, there is this feeling that we need to protect children. And, and these are both perspectives I can see and I can understand, I'm sure you do as well. What's the line? What's a good, what's a good way to deal with this? If, if, if you have any ideas around this. The line is to abolish the child regulation system, right? We don't need surveillance. The only people that are being surveilled are the most marginalized, which are us, right? Um, because there are affluent white people that use drugs that are not being surveilled. Uh, we are being surveilled in anything that we access public, public hospitals, public schools, public shelters, um, to receive any type of public services. That's where the surveillance occurs. It doesn't occur in private hospitals or in private doctor's offices, right? So why moms are not being surveilled? hot moms, quote unquote, are not being surveilled. We are the ones that are being surveilled. So we need to get rid of this system that we say we are is all for child welfare because there's nothing that is welfare about a child without their parent. Um, guys, would um, particularly the um, discussants, have you got any questions for our two presenters today, Hansel and Esben, and I'm, I'm, I'm very aware as well, Esben, you, you didn't have full opportunity to speak of the other side of the coin, did you, um, around the kind of French perspective as well. So uh, please feel free, if, if you've got anything more to add, please do. Um, no, not really. I, I, I didn't, uh, hadn't planned to s speak about the French experience. I hope that uh, Marie will, uh, will talk about that. <laughs> Yes, I will do with uh, Jean Maxence. Thank you. Not Just all. after. So Helena has just put into the chat if uh, Dina and uh, Jade, if you have anything to say about uh, the kind of circumstances that parents and mothers experience, really, I suppose, as they're trying to raise their, their kids and what kind of supports are particularly helpful and also it'd be really great to hear are there examples of this out there already that that you're aware of i was waiting to see if jade had anything to uh, offer um yeah i um so we we need to ask parents what they need right we need to ask mothers who are pregnant or parenting using drugs, what they need before we offer and we put upon them what we think they need. Um, and surely money <laughs> is one of the top things that they need, right? Because poverty is a huge issue. Surely housing is something that they need. Surely respite is something that they need. You know, um, assistance with their children, childcare. Uh, these are things that they need and actually want. Um, when, when we say, oh, there's affordable housing, affordable housing is not affordable for the poor. Um, when they, you know, uh, HRA or, or, or the welfare checks, um, that doesn't get you through a week, let alone a month 
you know, with one child, let alone three or four. So we really need to think about it from, from a poverty aspect because those are the issues that arise when we are targeting this, this population, which includes myself. Um, we need to talk about, you know, how do we get more, more funding or more money into this household? How do we get more um, access to whatever services they may need, such as, you know, the services that I, um, <coughs> excuse me, that I said before, <clears throat> it, which is money, housing um, and respite, right? Those are the top three things that I re that I came across while I was representing parents for almost 10 years. Thank you so much. Uh, Jade, have you got anything you want to add to this? Um, I, I think Dinah said it really well. And the only thing I would add is if, if women aren't brought into the equation and asked what they need. And if poverty isn't addressed and the other factors that intersect with this, um, you know, systemic racism and criminalization, then yeah, it increases overdose risk, not only just uh, impacting well-being, but that means more women are going to die because they're going to be afraid to access services. They're going to be hiding their substance use. And in Canada, we have a very toxic poison drug supply right now. It's extremely dangerous. So it's an urgent issue to be actually working with and asking uh, poor marginalized uh, women exactly what they need in, in relation to uh, services, childcare, and addressing um, non-stigmatizing approaches and non-punitive approaches to substance use. I mean, in, in Canada, we have a scale up of harm reduction right now with things like drug checking and take-home naloxone and increased access to supervised consumption sites, but that doesn't mean mothers are going to feel comfortable accessing those sites. Even with decriminalization, they're going to experience the stigma that goes along with ideas around motherhood, especially for those who are racialized. Um, so that's the only um, thing that Thank I would you. add. Thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, Diana, I should say before, before I sign off and move on to the next panel, uh, that lots and lots of uh, plaudits for you for speaking up and being truthful and upfront and honest about uh, what you had to say. So thank you so much again. And thank you, everyone. And sorry, Hansel, I didn't get to you for any questions, but thank you for, for your presentations. Greetings and good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, staying with us this afternoon and evening for those of you in Europe. Uh, I am, it's my pleasure to introduce the fourth panel of this two-part series, International Advances in Harm Reduction Under COVID. So we will start with a presentation by Matt Bond and Natasha Tunar, um, and followed by Ryan McNeil for the first 15 minutes. They will then be followed by uh, Marie Geoffrey Roussid and Jean-Maxence Grenier for another 15 minutes. We will then include our discussants and hopefully there will be time at the end for your questions. And please feel free to add your questions into the chat box or into the Q&A box as they come up for you and we will get to them at the end. So Matt and Natasha, would you like to start? I don't know if my camera's working that well, let me see. So are you okay if I go ahead without my camera on? Because for whatever reason at this time of day, my camera stopped working because of volume of um, uh, people using the internet. Please, please, by all means. Okay, uh, let me get into this. So yeah, so thanks for having us today. Um, we're really excited to talk to you about, um, this is, what are we getting? So we're, we're excited to talk to you today about safe supply or the concept of safe supply. And uh, so in 2019, my organization, the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs, had de developed uh, the safe supply concept document, which was the first time, uh, I think in Canada or probably throughout the world, that there was a document that was um, written by people who use drugs that actually talked about a substance that we actually need to you know, have well-being and um, live in this world without fear of being criminalized. And so the concept of safe supply is the, like the role of safe supply and drug policy as well as clarity as to what it means. And so what it means, as you can see here, safe supply refers to a legal and regulated supply of drugs with mind slash body altering uh, properties that traditionally have only been accessible through the illegal unregulated drug market. And that would cover all substances. And I think all of us have seen um, 
since COVID has you know, happened and, and the borders were shut down, that there's been more um, adulterated and, and contaminated substances that are coming in and killing people, you know, in Canada anyway, our, our landscape is over 26,000 uh, people have died of a uh, accidental drug poisoning, um, you know, over the last several years. And it's, it's to me, it's almost a, a non, a non-starter that we would actually entertain this and, and not have an issue with it as a society. So when we talk about safe supply, and, you know, it's a contentious issue uh, in a lot of places. But w- the reason why safe supply uh, works for our community is because uh, we have, you know, daily. Uh, you can you could go into a methadone or a buprenorphine program in Canada on the day. And, but it's not satiating the need for the mass amount of people who use drugs within our communities. So the need for safe supply exists within our human rights because prohibition-based policy is by nature dehumanizing and degrading to our community and society and humanity as a whole. And actually when we allow individuals in our society to suffer, we allow all of our society to suffer because you know we have to really think about this in, in the human rights of people who use drugs and understand that like any other drug, Maybe your anxiety medication, this one doesn't work and you're titrated to another one. There's also that aspect for our community as well. And so we all should also should have the availability to have economy and agency when we use drugs. Um, it is not morally blameworthy for us to be able to use substances. There's people all over this world that consume drugs and there's no issue uh, with that drug use. However, people that have you know, intergenerational trauma um, have been abused, have all these other things. Sometimes those drugs can become, you know, a, a, an issue for them at times. But that doesn't mean that all drugs are bad for our whole society. And so what the, what happens with this is historically, like prohibition has been a tool to s- stigmatize and discriminate, discriminate, sorry, against our community, especially poor people. And as Jade and Dinah just spoke to, women, Black people, Indigenous people, um, parents are are you know at, at most risk within our drug policy uh, today, and so we would like to think the safe supply gives people agency and autonomy in making their own choices. It uh, changes the narrative of by respecting the autonomy and agency of those who consume to or, or choose to consume drugs, uh, removing labels of blameworthiness and, and respecting their drug use behavior. So. In the long shot, our organization would love to see a regulated drug supply, which is legal and available to the mass of people in our country, but that's not where we're at, also with decriminalization. Um, you know, our justice system has perpetuated the war on drugs, which has disproportionately affected uh, people of color, poor, indigenous, and, and especially relative to the amount of drugs consumed by society on a whole. Um, the more resources resources we have to navigate the legal pitfalls of engaging in drug use, um, especially if we're, you know, I hate to say this, but if we're white, we have better we have a better way of getting out of the legal pitfalls. But if you're you're one of the um, marginalized, more marginalized communities and just using illegal drugs, as I said earlier, person of color or indigenous, it, it is um, and women and the LGBTQ two population. It's detrimental. We have more poor people in jail right now that have been criminalized because they use something to make them well. And yet we, we stigmatize them and, and actually you know, it's detrimental to their health and well being. Um, so the more resources we have, the better. And so, why do we talk about this? The effectiveness of interve- interventions work different for different individuals. And so, evidence is consistent in showing that people who use drugs are more likely to benefit from safe supply within a treatment model, because that's where we're at, uh, in comparison to the more traditional opioid agonist treatment in terms of keeping clients on treatment. It lowers the amount of, of illegal drug use and creates stability uh, and improves their quality of life. Um, so I know I only have a few minutes because there's three of us presenting and I don't want to you know, take anybody else's time, but thank you for having me today and I'll kick it over to Matt. Uh, it refers to safe supply program designers should be creative and thoughtful to the needs slash wants of the drug using population being served. So that could be s- specific subgroups within our drug use and, use and culture that are additionally marginalized, such as prisoners who use drugs, members from the two-spirited LGBT, LGBTQ 
plus community, members from the African, Caribbean, and Black community, women who are pregnant and are, who are mothers, or it could be just a, a geographical context in, in terms of the local drug supply. We have um, two programs in Vancouver, one in Victoria, um, the SAFER programs that are currently using um, different forms of fentanyl, um, uh, oxycodone, the 20 milligrams of oxy, oxycontin tablets. So people can consume their drugs as they want and, and see fit. So if it's through kind of um, smoking maybe an oxycontin tablet or uh, using sufetanol, which can be uh, consumed in multiple different ways. It's really kind of meeting the people's needs where they're at. Um, and we also have av availability to prescribe fentanyl patches that can be used either through IV drug use, um, inhaling it, you can smoke drug patches, and you can also um, just uh, chew them and kind of consume them orally, or they are made for an additional mode of uh, transdermal consumption which you stick it on and lasts between 48 to 72 hours. So we really got to get creative. And um, you know, if healthcare providers are going to get behind the ideas um, of safe supply and start prescribing that, you must sit down with the FDA and maybe the urban survivors unions and start to utilize some of the medications and substances that are currently available. Uh, one that always comes to mind to me is the nasal spray cocaine, which is FDA approved. Um, and so to kind of summarize and end it off, I just want to highlight a question that was proposed in the, the first two sessions this morning um, by a, a member of the Urban Survivors Union. And I'd like, you know, people who use drugs, academic researchers, medical doctors, and policymakers that join today to think and debrief on this after. But why is the U.S. so behind on providing these basic fundamental medications like methadone or buprenorphine for opioid agonist therapy medication? And what do we need to do to kind of get past that and look at a more sustainable, um, comprehensive, effective, and as Natasha said, like really empowering the people who use drugs and uh, looking at their human rights uh, by providing them a safe supply so they don't have to play Russian roulette every time they use. And, and I'm just, I'll flip that over to you, Brian, and, and thank you everyone for having us today. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Ryan McNeil. I'm a assistant professor in the Yale School of Medicine. And I've led a piece with a wonderful group of colleagues. I'm sharing the screen now. Uh, looking at the implementation of safer supply alternatives during intersecting COVID-19 and overdose health emergencies in British Columbia, Canada during the pandemic. Um, we're very specifically, as touched on by Matt and uh, Natasha, the overdose crisis in Canada, it's driven by, by fentanyl. Uh, and, and really since 2015, 2016, it's overtaken the opioid supply and both become the, the dominant opioid and driver of overdose related deaths. More, more recently, there's been an even greater uptick in uh, adulteration within the, the broader supply to include a, a larger number of adulterants like atazolam and, um, and other things that grossly increase the potential for, for overdose uh, deaths, as well as rising polysubstance use, and very particularly fentanyl stimulant polysubstance use. So when COVID hit, it was occurring alongside an existing emergency, the overdose crisis. And there was a, basically an identified need to act to address the, the harms driven by the, the toxic drug supply. And so a group in British Columbia from the BC Center on Substance Use and with the provincial government and other partners that included people who use drugs developed risk mitigation guidelines in the context of dual public health emergencies to facilitate the prescribing of alternatives to a highly toxic drug supply, and very specifically to facilitate access to um, prescription opioids and stimulants to provide people with alternatives to street drugs. So things like oral hydromorphone tablets, sustained release oral morphine, dextroamphetamine, um, and methylphenidate, both uh, slow release and instant release uh, formulations. And these were made available to people. The, the slide here kind of breaks it down and it's in the paper which I'll post into the chat. 
um, that, that breaks down what specifically was, was available and the amounts. Um, and so what we wanted to do is to explore the implementation and effectiveness of these guidelines among people who use drugs in the province and how they were acting to facilitate access to a, a safer supply of regulated drugs and to limit um, engagement with a, a highly toxic drug supply and in turn reduce overdose vulnerability. And so what we did is we recruited people from across the province, uh, across all health authorities, um, in both rural and urban locations through a, a network of community-based harm reduction organizations that we partnered with. We ended up doing interviews with 40 people um, engaged with this program uh, between February and July of 2021. And then we analyzed uh, this data using an inductive and iterative approach, as well as by drawing on the risk environment framework to situate this intervention and the, the changes under COVID within the, the broader context of what's happening in the province. And so what we really found is that A, um, COVID-19 led to severe disruptions in the, the illicit drug market that led in the immediate term, particularly to increased prices, um, drug shortages, fluctuating potency, particularly of, uh, of fentanyl, where there were pretty sustained and significant swings in potency and a, a greater prevalence of, of dangerous adulterants within the supply. And if you recall back to that earlier slide, you see rising uh, deaths involving benzodiazepines. Very specifically, we saw an uptick in uh, atazolam in the, the illicit opioid supply. So COVID also made it difficult for people to survive and manage their drug use due to disruptions in, in how they made money and other disruptions in their lives. Given that folks were particularly living within the context of severe poverty, criminalization, um, these worsened under COVID for the most part, particularly where they weren't able to access many of the supports that other Canadians could access. And what this did is it led to uh, more erratic drug use patterns, people having frequent withdrawal experiences, and that leading to heightened overdose risks as it became difficult for people to manage their drug use and led them to use under, under duress. And so then people were effectively motivated to access no cost prescription alternatives to, to limit their exposure to the toxic drug supply, but also to, because they, they just weren't interested in treatment, often had bad experiences with treatment, but still wanted to be safe or as safe as they could possibly be within this context. And what that ended up doing is giving them greater control over their drug use patterns mitigating these experiences of withdrawal and increasing their safety by allowing them to, to use more safely, not under duress, and drugs that, that weren't potentially toxic. Now, there were limitations to the program, and very specifically, the, the medicalized approach um, and the prioritization of withdrawal management limited the effectiveness of, of this as a model. Um, very specifically, it was unable to accommodate broader drug use experiences and particularly euphoria because most people just experienced it as something that kept them well or from being sick. For people who also had severe chronic pain accompanying their opioid use, it was sometimes inadequate in, in addressing those needs. There were severe access barriers, particularly in rural areas. And so of the approximately 100,000 people in British Columbia who have an opioid use disorder, only about 6,000 people accessed medications and still a smaller number access prescription opioids through the program, pointing to how it really just, the implementation failed to meet the demand for these programs, particularly within the context of relatively high level opposition from, from physicians across the province to safer prescribing. And then finally, many of the program requirements were experienced as, as quite burdensome and very particularly some particularities of the provincial methadone program were ported over to this. And so people were required to have daily pickup, um, which was incredibly problematic in the context of all of the other disruptions that people were experiencing. And again, heightened rural specific barriers to, to accessing medications. So ultimately, uh, the, the big takeaway is that the people were safer and able to use safer, but because of how this program was delivered and because of the drugs that it was providing people with, it failed to fully meet the demand for, 
for these services or, or for a safer supply. And then so ultimately to cycle back to what Matt and Natasha have raised, there's a need to align safer supply models with the, the real world experience and desires of people who use drugs. And that will likely necessitate providing regulated versions of criminalized drugs. And there's a variety of different models that could potentially work to do this in a way that's safe and that works. But ultimately, they need to also ensure that there is, as part of doing this, there is equitable access to these alternatives to the toxic drug supply for those people who are most impacted by the overdose crisis. And the reality is, right now, we don't have a lot to offer people who are using drugs who aren't on or interested in treatment. And this represents one of the most promising approaches that takes away that key driver of overdose deaths right now, which is the fact that our drug supply is completely toxic. And if people are interested in learning more about this, we cover this in depth in a, a podcast episode this month, um, Crackdown, which takes a deep dive into the safer supply prescribing and the push for access to, to safer regulated drugs in, in Canada. Uh, and I'll so post much, a link to that in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. And so I just want to take a moment to remind anyone who is joining us who wasn't here at the top of the session to look at the bottom right hand corner and you will notice a globe icon. The next portion of our presentation will include uh, one presenter who will be speaking in French. So if English is your dominant language, please choose the English language uh, option. If French is your language, you may choose the French language option. And now I will pass it to our next two presenters. Thank you. So hello everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, my name is Marie Geoffrey Roustide. Uh, I am a French researcher based in Paris and I will make the, my presentation uh, with uh, Jean-Maxence Granier, uh, who is the president um, of the French um, uh, national uh, activist uh, group of people who use drugs. And I'm very honored to be part of this panel today um, my presentation will be focused on harm reduction, empowerment, collective responsibility, and welfare states. And I will present the case of drug consumption rooms. So this is a presentation that, ah, sorry, I can, I, uh, that is based on two uh, papers um, that are included uh, in our um, special issue uh, for American Journal uh, of Public Health. And uh, you can see on the screen all the wonderful uh, co-authors uh, of um, these two papers that I will present now. Um, and the um, participants of this paper are uh, researchers, um, activists, and people with life experience. No, I have a problem with uh, the slides. So drug consumption rooms uh, are one uh, form of um, structural interventions that have proven effective in reducing um, overdose, uh, thereby protecting the health and welfare of people who use drugs. So harm reduction interventions like uh, DCR can be blocked uh, in policy environments that support harm reduction, as well as in environments of comparatively repressive drug policies. Harm reduction policy is an effective way to empower people and respectively, the activism of people who use drugs is critical in creating the conditions in which harm reduction interventions become possible. But structural interventions supported by welfare states are also needed to implement sustainable harm reduction policies and to enable more favorable environments for people who use drugs, including access to care, social justice, and uh, decriminalization. France, at an international level, um, France can be considered as a model of harm reduction, uh, thanks to its large access uh, to opioid substitutive treatments. Currently, we have in my country 85% of people who attend harm reduction facilities or drug treatment centers 
who are on OST. Additionally, as a welfare state, France allows free access to healthcare and public financial support to harm reduction facilities and drug addiction centers that are consequently sustainable. Nevertheless, French drug policy maintains a strong emphasis on the criminalization and biomedicalization of drug use that still neglects other areas of harm reduction as social and racial justice and inclusion. As a consequence, this repressive drug policy impeded to implement drug consumption rooms in France during 30 years. For example, in Switzerland, in Bern, the first drug consumption room was implemented in 1986, so 30 years before France. But in 2016, alliances between local politicians, people who inject drugs collectives, NGOs, and the, welfare, the French welfare state make drug consumption rooms possible in two cities. One has been implemented in Paris by Gaia NGO, and another has been implemented in Strasbourg by ITAC in uh, 2016. With the introduction of drug consumption rooms through public initiative in France, the state is partially taking responsibility for managing risk associated with drug use in public spaces for residents who live near open drug scenes, but the French state is also partially taking responsibility for protecting people who use drugs who may be socially vulnerable due to stigmatization and criminalization. From our perspective, and that's we try to argue in our two papers, drug consumption rooms should be considered not only as a public health approach to prevent drug use associated harms, but also as an approach that defines a particular relationship between people who inject drugs, residents, and the state. In France, and especially in Paris, before and at the beginning of drug consumption rooms implementation, one residence movement that had a large audience in the French media was very negative towards the positive impact of drug consumption rooms. And some of these residents may sometimes be very violent with people who inject drugs. Residents' discourse at this moment often reveals their reluctance to share urban spaces with people who inject drugs, as well as their fears and rejection. And this attitude was um, mostly influenced by the repressive policy uh, that France des decided to uh, to implement. After the Parisian drug consumption room opened, another social movement which brought together three different residence groups supported the idea that implementation of drug consumption rooms was a way to collectivize the management of risk that improves the health and well being of people who inject drugs as well as the daily lives of residents. People who inject drugs who attend the drug consumption rooms also described how drug consumption rooms served as a safe space for them to relax when they were otherwise in emotional distress when they inject in public space. Creating a safe space for people who inject drugs is also considered beneficial to residents from the second social movement because it reduces occurrence of injecting practices in public spaces and the number of discarded syringes uh, in the streets has been divided by three after the implementation of the drug consumption room in Paris. These residents from the second social movement employed both sanitary and moral reasoning to argue that drug consumption rooms are not only safe place for injecting, but also humanitarian areas safe from the judgment and stigmatization of people who inject drugs. These residents were also very sensitive to the importance of cohabitating with people who inject drugs in urban areas. And it's also important to mention that people who inject drugs can also be considered as co-residents. 
The French experience shows that drug consumption rooms have the potential to become an instrument for civic collaboration, for the destigmatization of people who inject drugs, and for improving the well being of people who inject drugs and residents in urban areas. So I will now uh, give the floor to Jean Maxence Granier, who will speak in French, but the slides are in English. Jean Maxence, c'est à toi. Bonjour à tous, merci de me donner la parole dans ce, ce cercle. Euh, merci euh, Marie d'avoir euh, présenté ces enjeux euh, autour des salles de consommation à moindre risque. Alors, euh, j'ai vu qu'il y a eu des débats houleux sur le question-réponse à propos du terme rétablissement. Et comme j'ai l'intention de l'employer, je... Je, je, je vais préciser d'où je parle. Donc, je représente une association d'usagers de drogue en France, fermement engagée dans la lutte contre la prohibition, dans la promotion de la réduction des risques et dans la déstigmatisation et l'accès à une pleine citoyenneté des usagers de drogue. Et je suis sans doute parmi vous comme des tas d'autres gens usagers de drogue parce que euh, en France, par exemple, et ailleurs, certains se sont battus dans les années 80 pour permettre l'accès aux seringues et, euh, à certains nombres, et donc permettre à un certain nombre d'entre nous d'échapper à euh, tel ou tel virus. Voilà. Mais euh, je voulais quand même aborder cette question euh, du rétablissement en soulignant qu'en France, le... le, 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 le Comment dire, les choses sont assez différentes. Le modèle qui domine, c'est le modèle de la réduction des risques. Et ce que je voulais mettre sur la table, c'est que souvent, et on le voit ici même, il y a une très forte opposition entre ces deux modèles, avec d'un côté le, la réduction des risques, l'usage, et de l'autre l'abstinence. Et cette abstinence, elle est souvent rapporté justement à la, à la prohibition et à l'interdit. Et euh, il me semble que cette opposition, elle a vocation à être déconstruite et remise en cause parce qu'il y a certains éléments qui sont intéressants et qui font le lien entre des démarches qui peuvent paraître euh, totalement opposées. Et ce, ces liens, c'est par exemple justement la logique d'autosupport ou d'entraide, c'est euh, l'approche par le groupe. C'est aussi intéressant de noter que la notion de père et danse, elle a émergé au sein de la réduction des risques pour, euh, par exemple, mieux maîtriser les usages et les risques à, attachés à ces usages, et elle est aussi apparue dans le champ du rétablissement euh, au sein des groupes d'entraide ou euh, des associations de gens qui, qui, qui choisissent cette voie-là. Et donc, euh, il me semble qu'au lieu de reconduire toujours euh, cette opposition, il faut extraire l'abstinence dès lors qu'elle relève d'un choix, d'une proposition, d'un désir de la personne qui la recherche, de l'usager de drogue qui, pour x ou x raison, à un moment recherche cela, il faut l'extraire du modèle prohibitionniste, du modèle moralisateur, du modèle politique de stigmatisation des usagers. Et euh, on en a un exemple aujourd'hui euh, assez clair en France, où euh, Marie l'a évoqué, même s'il existe des salles de consommation, elles font encore débat, et en ce moment à Paris, euh, où il y a une scène de crack, une scène ouverte de crack, il y a beaucoup de débats sur l'installation de lieux d'accueil pour ces personnes usagères de drogue et ça fait débat. Et les associations de riverains, souvent, ne disent, ne disent pas ou ne disent plus, mettons ces gens-là en prison, etc. Ils disent, envoyons-les dans des centres de rétablissement loin de chez nous. Et, et ça, c'est intéressant. Euh, 
parce que, disons que même des riverains qui subissent effectivement des dommages et qui sont hostiles à, 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 ce, à, à ces comportements dans l'espace public, donc qui sont liés évidemment largement à la pauvreté, à la vulnérabilité et qui ont, et qui ont une dimension aussi souvent, euh, euh, une, une détermination raciale, ils ne, ils ne disent plus simplement euh, « mettez tous ces gens-là en prison », mais ils proposent l'alternative la, euh, de l'éloignement, évidemment, et du rétablissement. Et, et ils opposent ça au modèle d'un accueil de proximité que Marie euh, vient de décrire et qui est évidemment utile, important, y compris avec des gens qui consomment. Et il me semble que, si vous voulez… Euh, on a tout intérêt à plutôt articuler ces offres, c'est-à-dire des offres d'accueil de proximité au plus près des usagers qui sont souvent dans des, dans des circonstances très difficiles quand ils consomment dans l'espace public et c'est absolument nécessaire de le faire, et des lieux de soins pour les gens qui, choisissent, qui choisiraient cette voie pour, par exemple, aller vers l'abstinence s'ils si, euh, ne choisissent pas euh, la substitution. Euh, et ce, ce problème est d'autant plus crucial que, que, comme vous le savez, pour le crack, la, la substitution n'existe pas euh, de la même façon que pour les opioïdes avec la méthadone ou le subutex. Voilà, donc ce que je voulais porter euh, dans ce débat, c'est de dire, au lieu de reproduire cet affrontement ancien entre RDR et rétablissement, il faut délivrer le rétablissement de son carcan de, du modèle prohibitionniste, dès lors qu'il est le lieu d'un choix individuel, dès lors qu'il est le lieu de l'émergence d'une parole des usagers eux-mêmes et que, évidemment, il échappe à un modèle de contrainte, d'injonction thérapeutique. Et euh, je pense que euh, soutenir cette position euh, de dépassement de cette confrontation euh, autorise tout autant à euh, clairement s'inscrire dans une remise en cause de la prohibition comme la euh, moins bonne des politiques en matière euh, de drogue. Voilà ce que je voulais euh, essayer d'exprimer euh, devant vous. Et d'ailleurs, pour terminer sur le Covid qui sert de cadre à nos échanges, ce moment Covid, il a mis en évidence des vulnérabilités, en particulier pour les gens qui consomment dans la rue, mais il a aussi souligné comment, dans l'autosupport et dans la réduction des rites, comme dans l'entraide de gens qui cherchent leur établissement, les outils de, comme celui que nous utilisons ce soir euh, ont pu être euh, utilisés pour euh, continuer à ce que les personnes usagères de drogue ou usagères du système de soins continuent à s'épauler et euh, à s'informer les unes les autres. Voilà ce que je voulais essayer d'exprimer ce soir sans euh, souhaiter évidemment choquer personne. Thank you so much for both of your presentations. And now we are shifting to the discussion portion of the panel before we move to the questions. So I would like to invite Matt Southwell from UK Drug Users Union uh, to join us for uh, about five minutes of response. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining us this evening. Uh, yes, hello, my name's uh, Matt Southwell. <clears throat> I'm the project executive of EuroEnput, the European Network of People Who Use Drugs. And I also work with a drug user group in the UK called Respect. Um, I think it's important that when we're looking at this debate, as other speakers have said, that we understand that drug control is an intentional tool of social uh, control, particularly of the poor and of a uh, deliberate tool of racial injustice. When we understand that, um, we understand that drug treatment is often about framing society's judgment and desire of people uh, who use drugs and those who have failed to listen to the warnings and have got into uh, troubles or, or longer term issues with drugs. Um, however, I also understand 
that to bring about social change, we need to form alliances. And for me in the UK now, we, we do work across all types of drug users, active drug users, recreational drug users, and people from the recovery movement. For me, the objection is having recovery imposed on us. It's not uh, an objection to peers who choose recovery as their model of self-help. It's not a model I find helpful personally, but lots of people find different things helpful. And I think we should have choice. And I'm happy to organize together to overcome prohibition. Um, I think uh, when we look at DCRs, um, I think we need to understand that society is often expressing its discomfort at people using drugs in the way that drug consumption rooms are framed or designed. So they often become highly medicalized clinical spaces uh, that don't uh, seek to acknowledge the pleasure or community that goes with drug taking. What we know from people who use drugs is they much prefer a more front room style, drug drop-in center style approach rather than this highly medical model. My uh, peer-led research team is doing some work uh, looking at drug, the, uh, drug users' views of drug consumption rooms. We ask them uh, how they would judge drug consumption rooms as being successful. They said having a drug consumption room would show that society cares for us. That's the indicator of success. When asked how would we know it was successful, they said, ask us if we feel cared for. Now we have all these other indicators around overdose deaths, drug related litter, all of these other issues. But we have to understand that the relationships uh, in drugs consumption rooms fundamentally frame people's comfort with using those spaces. And that's why the development of peer led drug consumption rooms, I think has been such an interesting and important development. Um, when we look at access to prescriptions, uh, stimulants and opioids, many people who use drugs have to uh, persuade doctors that we actually have more deserving diagnoses, ADHD, weight loss, pain, physical, not psychological, um, those are good excuses to use these drugs. The challenge is uh, what one Swiss psychiatrist described as the professional disquiet with the flash effect. The disquiet that a drug treatment or OAT might give us pleasure. And I think um, that often reflects the desire to control the route at which we take different opioids. When in fact, the versatility of opioids, particularly some of the morphine drugs, and uh, which Matt described very effectively, that allows us to use them in different ways at different points in the day. I think people's frustration often with methadone is its bluntness as a tool and its poor relationship when you're still trying to actively use drugs. You're constantly pushing up your tolerance, which is something you can avoid you know, by dipping in and out uh, when using morphine-based medications. So finally, just for me, I want to say that for me, drug consumption rooms respectfully delivered, heroin-assisted treatment, safe supply and decriminalization are part of the conditions required for the ceasefire in the war, in the ceasefire that will lead us to the peace in the war on drugs. I think it causes us to rethink how we currently do drug treatment. And these models are starting to conceptually rethink the whole way we talk and think about drugs. If we understand it's about social control and racial injustice, we have to unpick and rethink it all. Thank you very much for the ex excellent papers. And can I say to the Canadian peers, brilliant campaign. We look forward to be uh, following up and being inspired by you. Thank you so much, Matt. I see that Don has just joined us. Don, are you able to turn on your microphone and your camera or shall I give you another minute to get settled in and go to Tom first?
think Don just dropped off. So uh, Thomas Kerr, nope, you mind? I'm here. Oh, you're here, Don. Okay, great. So you have about five minutes if you'd like to give us a few of your remarks. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, I'm trying to turn turn my camera on. Don't worry about it. You can start speaking. We can. We'll we'll still listen. Thank you. All right. Um. All right. So so yeah, I'm Don Jackson from uh, North Carolina Survivors Union in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. I run the uh, Terrain Service Program here. Um. So I was gonna say uh. So um, the U.S. We don't have the uh, robust programs uh, seen in other countries. Uh, instead, we have organic uh, community-led programs. And uh, so uh, nowadays, safe supply, as everyone has been saying, is uh, it remains to be a, a far reach given the uh, the current U.S. political environment we have here. Um, Community-led organizations are left to fend for themselves uh, through through the support of grant funding and while trying to offer services uh, that combat the, uh, the increasingly volatile uh, street market supply. Um, so we result with uh, some of us uh, with uh, safer bathrooms programs, which is it's a closest that most drug user led programs in the US can come to uh, safe consumption rooms. Uh, a safe consumption site like overdose prevention. While uh, we can't openly offer uh, our space to the community as a, as a safe environment to consume substances, we've, uh, we've implemented strategies to make make our bathroom safer for those who, who uh, choose to break our rules um so uh which um so so we've turned we turn our bathroom door around you know put it so so it opens out instead of in um uh we, we installed a um intercom system uh and so so our uh employees can and uh check on check on the um participants that are about every three minutes or so make sure everything's all right um, um, let's see. So we've observed uh, in North Carolina uh, increasingly uh, concerning shifts in supply with uh, with the with the dangerous uh, adulterants such as xylazine. We've been seeing a lot of, uh, which is a horse tranquilizer that um, has dangerous dangerous side effects, um, such as. Uh, ulcers that, that, that refuse to heal, um, um, uh, central nervous system depression and, and respiratory depression, um, uh, uh, and, and, and if, if not treated by a doctor, um, which will eventually result in death, uh, without a doubt, um, um, been seeing a lot of, uh, uh, cannabinoids and 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 even hallucinogenics in in in, in the heroin supply here. Um, um, so uh, um, these shifts and these shifts have have have, uh, have had a tremendous effect on on the local community and 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 prompted the development of our drug testing program. Which uh, so we have uh, um, we've had a. a a FTIR machine uh, donated to us by Nan Goldman, uh, which is a photographer in, in, New, in New York City. It's been around for a long time. Um, and during the uh, Overdose Awareness Day, we, we actually christened it, uh, named it, named our FTIR Nan. <laughs> so uh, that was pretty cool. Um, uh, so yeah, we call it Nan. Uh, um, so uh, the NCSU, so, so we're a drug, a drug user led organization and, uh, and uh, our drug, drug checking, checking program follows this method. All, the, all decisions regarding program operation are, are made by drug users. Um, let's see, what was I saying? What was I saying? We were, um, 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 uh, so we've been putting out um, 
accurate and actionable uh, information to our to our people, uh, so they can so they can make informed decisions around around the results that we give them. And uh, altogether, the program has has had an incredible impact on our participants. We have participants uh, express concern about substances being found in their products, which which uh, you know were unidentified. And so after after giving them the, the results, you know, a number of participants have, have changed suppliers. Um, we've had we've had participants even throw their supply away or um, what they what they brought us. You know, they they just they threw it away uh, right there. If they had xylazine in it, we we encourage them actually to throw it away. Um, um, on with um, Sheila, the moderator. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we do have about 10 or 11 minutes for questions. So um, hopefully if we get a question that you can respond to, Don, you can um, perhaps finish that train of thought. But I would invite the rest yeah. of our panelists now to um, turn on their microphones and turn on their cameras if that's possible for them so that we can uh, take a look at some of the questions that have emerged in the chat box but also use this as an opportunity for you to respond to one another if um, if you so choose. But one of the things that, you know, as the moderator, I'd like to use my moderator pass is to actually invite uh, Dr. Kerr, who, um, what, who, who forewent his, um, his five minute uh, response period, but I'd like for him to kick off the discussion if, if he feels open to it, to kind of reflect on what you've heard over the past uh, several minutes. And if you were with us, for the rest of the day, any reflections that you'd like to offer to get us started? Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Thomas Kerr, and uh, I'm a professor in the Division of Social Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, and the Director of Research at the British Columbia Center on Substance Use. And um, wow, lots to reflect on um, from today's uh, talk, and I, I had prepared a bit of a, a discussion Point, but I'll just maybe summarize a few points. And I think that's um, first what strikes me is that, you know, if the pre presentations today and the supporting papers arrive at a common point, it's that, you know, the implementation of harm reduction interventions, despite strong supporting evidence in many instances, uh, really remains subject to controversy, misrepresentation, uh, public interference, and by consequence, uh, under implementation. Um, so what's the problem you ask? Well, it seems to me that the public at large and policymakers are, are really suffering from something akin to a bad hangover. As a society, we've somehow ended up drunk on prohibition and the abstinence expectations that come with it. And despite our efforts to relieve the pain, we can't seem to shake it. Further, you know, as a scientist who's working in the area, I think something that's often also under acknowledged is the extent to which uh, harm reduction science is politicized and misrepresented. Uh, you know, weak reviews of, of evidence for things like drug consumption rooms are continue to garner uh, significant attention despite the large body of evidence and the systematic reviews supporting their efficacy. And uh, at the same time, we continue to advocate for the same approaches as some solution to the ongoing overdose crisis such as uh, just expanding OAT and offering recovery options despite how far these have gotten us to this point. So I really think that, um, you know, the consequences of our unrelenting commitment to prohibition, abstinence and antiquated uh, assumptions about science has produced re rather remarkable constraints when it comes to implementing harm reduction interventions. Um, I think moving forward and making progress will ultimately require that we begin to question our assumptions stop representing the, the science of harm reduction and, rep and recognize that prohibition, uh, you know, as was summarized in a recent Lancet Commission report, is not only ineffective, but is actually responsible for the majority of drug-related harm experienced in our society. I'll maybe leave my comments there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And I think this brings up another really good point that was also referenced in this special um, uh, supplement that, that you all worked on is tension with the biomedicalizing or the diseasing of addiction. And there was something really interesting happening in the chat box, and I'm not sure if folks were noticing, even kind of acknowledging that calling them drug consumption room uh, has a way of demedicalizing and de public healthifying um, these interventions, which I think many of us saw or many of us might have believed that shifting from moral and criminal models 
towards medicalization and public healthification was a sign of progress, but it comes with its own perils. And I'm wondering if any folks on the line want to talk about some of the traps of this public healthification and medicalization and the ways in which we can still support autonomy and choice and pleasure in how we talk about these interventions. So I give the floor to anyone who wants to jump in. Well, I'll just jump in with a strategic example from how we're thinking and talking about safer supply, where now because safer prescription alternatives have been offered through, you know, what's been happening in British Columbia, Canada, allowing like hydromorphone and dextro amphetamine and, and other things, there's this thing that you can check the box and it's done, even though how it's being implemented isn't working precisely because it's of how it's medicalized. So the trap is that there's a co-opting of a concept like safe supply, a push to water it down into something that's possible or politically palpable, palatable, but you lose the essence of what's there in a way that completely detaches it from the lived experience of using drugs and things like euphoria and enjoyment and pleasure and all of those things central to drug using experiences. And so we, we really can't lose sight of, of what we're doing here. It's we're supporting people in being able to be safe, yes, but supporting people in being able to live and live on their terms as they see it. And that's effectively impossible to do within a framework of public health oriented primarily toward mitigating harm, wherein we need to allow for so much more, so much, a such deeper and more wholesome experience of, of drug use that matches with how people use. And that, I mean, frankly, includes providing access to criminal, currently criminalized drugs. Ryan, does anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, I'll be having, uh, there's a couple hands up on the pan, in the panel box as well. Just... Either of the mats, you are welcome. Uh, Southwell, sure. No, thank you. Um, I just wanted to just reflect quickly on my experience of uh, since the pandemic going on to methadone and being as part of the formal drug treatment system, having for the previous you know, 10, 15 years managed my uh, opioid dependency with um, through drug diversion through a friend who had a morphine prescription. And um, just the, how different it feels to have to go and talk to a doctor every single time I want to travel, to have to, you know, to be told I have to take the same dose every single day. No, to not be given the medication that I know works for me. When I have to raise my dose, they have to take two weeks to raise my dose to what I know it should be because otherwise they might kill me. Instead, they just leave me untreated for, no, poorly treated for two weeks. And it's just that, that experience. I, I can't explain how fundamentally different it is from being able to pay a friend for a box of medication that comes through my door, I manage it, I look after my life, I choose which route to use it by, and I have autonomy, I feel empowered, I manage my drug taking, I feel, I feel now infantilized, and it's just a pain. The biggest problem in my life right now is the limitations that drug treatment places on me, which is why I'm trying to detox. And I'm sorry, Natasha, I missed your hand, so please jump in. I know my camera's not working, which really sucks. So nobody can see me and look, <laughs> that's why you're looking over me. But anyway, I agree with Ryan and Matt. I think we have an issue right now uh, that we, we've over-medicalized every site or every uh, premise of what we want to offer people who use drugs. For example, would any of you go to a bar and have a drink and have to usher into a stainless steel table, have a drink and sit there without contact with other people and you know, no music, nothing, not allowed to talk to anybody and think that that's a good time. I think everybody here would probably say, no, that's pretty shitty. <laughs> it's like, so, I mean, when we think about that premise, our culture, like drug culture has been apprehended and it's been spit back out to us in a different format that doesn't recognize us as druggies. And so for the very fact that we do that, and then we still have to say, oh, well, we're providing treatment. We're giving these people, you know, places to use. Like, why aren't they, you know, accessing them? Because they're not uh, being effective with drug culture. And so if we're benign or like, you know, the, the environment that we're in doesn't suit us, we're not going to go there as much as people want us to. And so for those very reasons, I think um, safe supply comes into this. And I think like even when I said in the chat, drug consumption rooms is much less stigmatizing than supervised consumption. You know, why does somebody have to supervise me? I've been using drugs all my life. Like all of a sudden I need somebody to stand over and watch me. No, I just need a place to use where I'm not going to be criminalized, where I'm not going to face any further harm. 
we're in Canada now we have um, splitting and sharing with you know, if you do an exemption where people can actually do like what's called a micro deal with inside and you're not criminalized. So for all of those reasons, these sites exist but yet don't recognize our culture. And so the further we get away from that, the less likely we are to help our community. Thank you so much, Natasha. And I wanna recognize that we only have a minute left before we pass the mic to Dr. Helena Hansen to close us out. But I would love to invite Marie to give us one closing remark um, as, as a panelist, and then we'll, we'll invite Helena in to, to wish us off. Thank you, Sheila. So very briefly, uh, I would like also to enhance, uh, to highlight that drug consumption room is also um, a, a way to um, uh, give the opportunity to people who inject drugs to have a space where they can uh, enhance uh, pleasure with drugs. Because when um, you are forced to inject in public spaces, uh, that's very difficult to, to feel pleasure because you need to make your injection in a hurry and you, you are uh, obsessed by uh, hiding uh, you from the police. So drug consumption rooms um, is also a way to, to speak about pleasure and not only about uh, medication and a medicalized uh, model of harm reduction. Thank you so much, Marie. So I would invite Dr. Helena Hansen now to close us out. Thank you so much to all who joined us today and especially to the organizers, the panelists, um, I really, and all of the authors that contributed to the special issue. Anyone who's registered for this will get an email with a link to the special issue of American Journal of Public Health, as well as to the recording of this session. Uh, were you able to hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. So again, thank you. And we will be, thanks to all who made this possible, and we will be emailing the links to the American Journal of Public Health special issue and the recording of both sessions.